Good evening, friends. It's a pleasure to see so many of you over here, and I hope we will have a stimulating evening. Um, so I'm going to pause because coming from, as I do, with long years in the health sector, I cannot help saying that we have all the solutions on paper. We are also very disturbed by the fact that many of these solutions have behind them strong lobbies and the people who really need the health services are touted as your, uh, uh, the people for whom you work, but it doesn't really happen like that. It is very easy to, of course, blame the governments, the state governments particularly, but I would say that the public at large sometimes does not distinguish between medical service and public health. Public health, as we know, malaria, leprosy, TB, HIV, AIDS, is a pure public health responsibility and will only and always have to be done by governments. It's done the world over by governments. It can never be done by the private sector. Medical services, and in our country, uh, I think a lot of the money from people's pocket is going to pay for <coughs> medical services. And that means hospitals, starting from primary health care right up to hospitals. There are, of course, uh, ways of doing it. There's the HMO example of the United States. There is the insurance example. But I think in India, we do not have any entity capable of going to the field, going to the village. Yes, yes some of them, we have some shining examples like the Karuna Trust in Karnatak. They've taken over the entire primary health care uh, system and they're running it beautifully. But it has to be driven by passion and an individual. It just doesn't seem to work when you just farm it out as a job to be done. I think with your background and the fact that you have brought to the table not just your own experience, you have worked in primary health care and done something special, I read about that, but you have seen, you have a worldview of the financing, you have a worldview of the way the states run, the federal structure, the constitutional position, which really means that it is a, after all, um, um, health is a state subject under the constitution, whatever one may say. With that background and your own presence on the board of the Reserve Bank of India, not that the Reserve Bank helps the health sector directly, <laughs> But certainly you have a, a much larger, I would say, universe on, in which you've been operating. We look forward immensely to hearing you, and I do hope you will touch on some of these issues, the medical education issue, the whole s s uh, business of food and drugs, which are considered to be, well, you know, they'll happen, but they are, affect us much more. The fact that non-communicable disease is are taking us by storm before we have overcome communicable diseases, what, when there's such a huge canvas, what can we do to make the difference which is so necessary, so vital? And if you touch on what some states are doing, which in your point of view are doing well, I think that would give us much to think about and be inspired by. Thank you. Madam Shailaja Chandra, Vice Chancellor, uh, SNU. Uh, <laughs> Professor Gupta, distinguished members of the audience. When I was asked to give this lecture, I did ask the professor that, am I really the appropriate choice? As you've heard, my background is finance and banking. That's what I have done for 25 years. Uh, it is true, I have an interest in healthcare. Uh, I have done some work, as Madam pointed out, in uh, the delivery of primary care, uh, more at an R&D level, not, there is no aspiration to scale that to try and understand what were the limits of primary care. In my previous role, when I was at ICICI, I did have some exposure, though I never really got involved in detail, uh, with what the government was trying to do, uh, particularly uh, at the level of the ASHA. Uh, you know, Mekla is here, she's a member of your faculty. She was very much responsible for some of the work that we were doing there. Uh, so I, have, I would say somewhat of a, a broad understanding of these issues. In the last five years, uh, I have gotten a little bit more involved. I was a member of the high-level expert group that Dr. Srinath Reddy uh, chaired. Uh, and uh, the, the broadly, the finance sections uh, I got involved in trying to write, as well as some of the management sections uh, in this area. Uh, so so treat, please treat this uh, lecture as an uh, exploration, something that we can talk about uh, a little bit. And what I have done is I've pitched it, since this is the university audience, uh, to be slightly technical. 
uh, as a lecture, not as a casual conversation, but as a serious conversation. Because as Madam pointed out, uh, we have a serious problem uh, on hand. And, and the more I study it, uh, the more I find that uh, amongst the League of Nations now, uh, we are amongst the last to think about this. Far poorer countries uh, have experimented far more uh, with this. Uh, and and, and uh, I, I was recently at a two-week program at the World Bank uh, on health systems design. I, I was aghast to see the countries, what they have done, how far they have gone with far less stable governments, far more political challenges, uh, many in civil war, many facing active resistance, but have done a lot more uh, in this area than we have done. And, and uh, maybe there are uh, you know, deeper reasons why this is not going on. So, but please don't think of me as any kind of expert, but as somebody that is you know, very much trying to go on the journey. And, and, and we have experts here. We have, I see Mr. Desi Raju has joined us. It's wonderful to have such you know, seasoned people to comment and discuss uh, uh, these issues on. There are, interestingly, you know, Madam expressed her point of view, but when I see the dialogue, at least in the current framework, on healthcare, I see two perspectives uh, that are there. Uh, and I thought what I could do in this uh, discussion is to try and address uh, uh, both. Clearly, both perspectives recognize that health is important. Uh, we have doubled our lifespans. Uh, you know, anybody who tells you that the 90, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, we were doing better, they are just plain wrong. Uh, uh, you know, more than 50% of the children died uh, before uh, 1900 in the UK, before the age uh, of 10. Uh, and clearly, uh, medicine has changed that uh, completely. Uh, also, there is this issue, people have, will tell you, it's actually the water, it's the sanitation that makes a difference. The reality is, until 1941, there was no choice, because penicillin was used for the first time at large scale in 1944. Before that, there was no modern medicine. Uh, uh, and in fact, most of what was done before that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, even by modern standards, uh, plain quackery. Uh, uh, if you read the accounts of doctors in the First World War uh, and what they did versus doctors that they did in the Second World War, you can actually see the dramatic difference. And the bulk of the drugs that we use today are not more than 40 to 50 years old. Uh, and, and many of them actually have come from uh, the Ayurvedic practice uh, that have moved forward uh, into uh, allopathic practice. Uh, so clearly, healthcare is important, and, and you know, uh, work needs to be done uh, in this area, and it's a new uh, field, uh, but it's had already a fair amount of impact. The question, and the question I'm hoping we'll debate today, is how do we organize the provision and financing of healthcare uh, so that the health and well-being uh, of the population of the country is, is maximized? As economists, the initial position in any product and service uh, market that we take would be uh, the broadly uh, Walrasian, uh, broadly the market position to say the invisible hand uh, will somehow, uh, Adam Smith's invisible hand will provide the best uh, outcomes. You let the market function, things will happen, right? Clearly, there is a concern that some people may not have the money to participate. You know, it's a hundred year old idea that you transfer, do, you do lump sum transfers, don't interfere with markets, change initial conditions, tax the rich, give the money to the poor, let them participate in the market. So right, markets don't work for equity, in some senses is not the accurate position. They might not eventually produce equitable outcomes, but at least even market fundamentalists will tell you transfer of resources uh, is very much a part of kosher market thinking. Uh, to, to make sure that uh, uh, you know, uh, things happen. And the belief, active belief is not that uh, uh, the, you know, this is a desirable. The belief is that any interference by the government, any interference by uh, any policy maker uh, in this process, what they call the heavy hand, uh, will produce suboptimal outcomes, uh, will not actually uh, produce the outcomes uh, that you desire. Uh, so it's the, the market view uh, which is the starting position, uh, is that nothing needs to be done. And certainly in the current discourse, uh, uh, th there is a somewhat of a, this view seems to be somewhat gaining currency. You hear a little bit uh, uh, the view, 
that market should be left to figure this out, uh, and 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 uh, uh, you know uh, uh, that is the right position. It was already clear, and Madam referred to this, even to the market purists, that public goods, goods that uh, 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 you know, such as a well-functioning legal system, right? Uh, here, these are goods, and I'm sure most of you are, uh, are familiar with this this word. These are what they call public goods, which have two characteristics: you cannot deny access to individuals, and consumption by one does not reduce the availability for another. This is the classic definitions definition of a public good. So legal system, for example, satisfies this good. They are necessary for the markets to operate. If you didn't have law of contracts, you couldn't proceed. And markets do not produce them naturally because the whole process of markets requires prices and it's not obvious how do you price uh, uh, the, these products. And I would say over the last 70, 80 years, even the market fundamentalist believes that the public good uh, needs to be produced uh, by uh, uh, the government in some way, whether they directly manufacture it themselves or they facilitate, certainly they need to pay for it. And therefore, legitimate use of tax resources uh, uh, transfers, which is the first idea, and paying for uh, public goods, second idea. People would say that's a good framework to leave the government with. Uh, and in the context of healthcare, one could somewhat more broadly, and you know, the purist would balk at this definition, pest control, sewerage systems, these don't, they're not strictly public goods in the sense of that consumption by one does not reduce, it does. Uh, there is a finite availability of it. But at the margin, one could take the view that these are indeed public goods and that the government should actually finance it. Even if it does not provide it, it must definitely finance it. And, and in India, given the harsh terrain, etc., there's certainly the expectation that the government would be you know, called upon to actually deliver uh, this to the quality. This seems to be the view that, you know, uh, uh, we, we are faced with perhaps today when you are talking a lot about direct benefits transfers as the way forward, uh, you know, public services to be pulled back and to be replaced by this. And maybe there are a number of efficiency gains that you can get in other product markets for a view like this. Health, unfortunately, has two additional features that a casual discussion of product markets at an abstract level uh, misses. And both of these theory requires be present if we are to assume that the market is going to figure it out. One, and I understand now that this is uh, a, a biological, uh, uh, you know, evolutionary imperative uh, that allows us to survive and function, but has a problem in the healthcare context, is that we don't worry about the negative consequences of the future as much as we should as much as we rationally should. Now I understand biologically this happened because for the survival of the species, you needed people to react to averages, not to extremes. Because if they reacted to extremes, they wouldn't go out and hunt, they would not go out and uh, you know, uh, uh, face hardships because they'd be constantly worried about the possibility of death. Uh, whereas if they responded to the average, as a community we would do well while the individual may uh, actually perish. This is what we refer to as hyperbolic preferences. Uh, uh, and it's clearly a non-convex uh, uh, preference. Uh, and, and, and invisible hand does require convexity uh, to come up. And I'll go in a little bit later on into the somewhat of a detail of what it really means to us on the ground. That's one issue. The second uh, failure that you see in healthcare is that we do not fully understand our own health uh, uh, very well particularly if you look at invisible diseases like hypertension, diabetes, uh, without expert advice, you wouldn't know that you have it. In fact, one of the most sensitive indicators of well-performing health systems are cervical cancer mortality rates. The objective reality is that cervical cancer incidence rate worldwide is not that different between rich and poor countries. Mortality rates sharply diverge. In India, for example, we are the highest uh, cervical cancer mortality rate in the world. In every village in India, every year, one woman dies. In Turkey or in Thailand, the exact same thing happens once in 20 years. Uh, uh, the only difference is the functioning of the primary care system uh, because the defense against cervical cancer is not possible at the curative level. It's a disease that uh, uh, advances very, very slowly, but once it does take hold, 
it's a hard disease to uh, combat. I'm not a medical person. I'm just giving you what I understand. But uh, at the uh, early stages, uh, it's a sexually transmitted disease. It has principally caused by the human papilloma virus. Very easy to prevent, very easy to treat. Uh, in a clinical setting, such as the clinics that we run on the ground in the south, it's a 10 minute in and out uh, procedure uh, to do this. Right? You don't even need fancy cytology uh, to make it happen. There are lots of very, very cost effective methods uh, that can be used. Uh, we as people don't understand this very well. Cervical cancer mortality is not high necessarily only amongst the poor. It's the urban people of Delhi also have the same cervical cancer mortality because most women, including potentially in this room, have not gotten their pap smears done. Uh, and, and you know that's just the objective reality of how we are. That's the other aspect of health, uh, which is uh, called an information asymmetry. Also, Moore's law, the law that suggests how rapidly advances are taking place. It is not possible for human beings to keep pace with it. Doctors often know, perhaps appear to know sometimes, but often do know more about what's going on with solutions than we do. And again, markets require uh, these things to function, uh, uh, this, the symmetry to be much better for at least the classical uh, 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 you know, market to work. Because the market requires what we call price as being a sufficient statistic. If it's a sufficient statistic, then you can trade it and an equilibrium can be established. If it's not a sufficient statistic, then you can't actually trade the product. And if you can't trade the product, you can't actually get supply and demand uh, to equalize. Right? And these are the two features that produce outcomes worldwide that are clearly suboptimal. There is very poor health seeking behavior amongst all our parts. Uh, there is very high price elasticity of demand. If you look at work that is done by the Poverty Action Lab on mosquito nets, right, they find that when they go into a malaria endemic area, when malaria is a huge problem, and they try, the government tries to sell mosquito nets bought in a cheap way uh, at full price, there's virtually no demand for it. In fact, unless the price drops to near zero, the demand is zero. Because for primary care, uh, it, price elasticity is extremely high. Very small prices produce a sharp drop in consumption. Exactly the reverse is the case for secondary and tertiary care. There's virtually zero price elasticity. If you can afford it, if the doctor told you it's going to cost you 10 lakh rupees, you will beg, borrow, steal, you will get it done. Uh, the, 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 the demand function is virtually flat uh, at the, uh, high levels of care. As a result, when you allow markets to operate, you get massive oversupply of uh, uh, hospital care, tertiary care, secondary care, uh, uh, and you get a very uh, uh, natural undersupply uh, of primary care uh, because you know, that's how the market equalizes its equilibrium. You know it's suboptimal, and you know there are basic features about us and about the market that produced uh, this outcome. One of the solutions that people explore to deal with this issue and have been explored for a while is insurance as a function. Because one of the features of healthcare, uh, which is, makes it different uh, from other pro goods and services, but not necessarily the one that drives failure, but it's a feature of healthcare, is that events arrive using perhaps a Poisson distribution in a indeterminate, perhaps modelable, but uh, uh, uncertain manner. Right? So you'll get years of no action, very little expenditure, followed by sudden uh, events of extremely high uh, uh, expenses. So you might be very healthy, suddenly you get a heart attack, you know, from zero or maybe 10 rupees, 40 rupees per year, you have a 10 lakh expenditure uh, that, that, that comes up, right? And, and presence of health insurance, and this is not a finance class to talk about why and how insurance does, does it, it, potentially deals with this problem. Uh, also, if it works well, it also introduces an expert agent in the middle that potentially can help you deal with information asymmetry. Because uh, 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 you know, uh, there's somebody in the middle checking if the doctor lied to you, and if indeed the procedure that was recommended to you was indeed the procedure you needed, or was somebody just cheating you uh, uh, for this. Right. Unfortunately, voluntary health insurance, and no country has been able to make this work with voluntary health insurance, that is you decide when to buy it, runs smack into the hyperbolic preferences. Because we don't worry about the future as much, we don't buy insurance, right? We know it's some good thing to do at some point, but often people will think about insurance. You know, for example, when I was in ICICI, we would often be asked the question, 
can I buy insurance in the hospital? No, you can't because that's not the point at which you are being sold insurance, but that's the time that you say, and this is not just true of health insurance. For example, we know that once you cross the age of 55, you're not a good candidate for life insurance. But at the age of 55, your mortality is visible to you. That's where there is maximum demand for insurance products when they're actually quite useless uh, uh, for you because you don't have actually any what uh, the jargon calls insurable interest. A potential corrective measure, and if those that are interested, there's a very nice paper by Arrow of 60s paper, uh, which argued that indeed, if this is the problem, then one more intervention that the government can do is make it mandatory for everybody to buy insurance. Don't allow this as a choice. Let everybody uh, do it. Right? And certainly, uh, this is a direction, for example, President Obama's most recent effort has gone to make insurance purchase a requirement. Or alternately, for the poor, don't just give them cash, because we know on account of hyperbolic preferences, which even they have, uh, maybe perhaps even more so than all of us, uh, they will not use some of that cash to buy the right amount of insurance. So use some of the tax money to buy insurance for them. And that is the underlying logic for a scheme like RSBY or Rajiv Arogeshri, for example. Unfortunately, Arrow, smart as he was, missed a very key issue, right? Because you know, while invoking one solution, he forgot that the main market you're talking about is the uh, market mechanism, which needs a demand and supply, which needs a slope to the demand curve, a slope to the supply curve, in order to produce optimal outcomes. And, in a, and it's a very nice, fascinating dialogue. Mark Pauly, in a comment to that American Economic Review paper, uh, wrote and identified the fundamental flaw in Kenneth Arrow's argument, which is, if you sell insurance, at the point of consumption, the price of the product is zero. At a zero price, you get infinite demand, right? And indeed, for the supplier, at the point of consumption, at the point of supply, no matter how much he supplies, the price doesn't fall, right? So both of them are facing curves that do not have the required shape to give us uh, the equilibrium. As a result, all of the problems that you had without insurance of oversupply of secondary care, oversupply of tertiary care, undersupply of primary care starts to become visible because it responds to exactly the information asymmetry. Now you might say, what is the insurance company doing? It doesn't it have a role in disciplining everybody? The problem is there is an enormous principal agent problem. The insurer does not see what the doctor sees, right? And is constantly trying to make a judgment sitting far away what is required. Most insurers follow the easy path, raise the premium, right? You, of course, try to battle suppliers and uh, consumers because now remember, the consumer wants to take the service that the doctor advised him or her to. The doctor wants to supply the service that he advised. So both, you know, as they say in Hindi, Mia Bibi Razi, the Kazi is not able to do anything because both sides are saying insurers denying claims and it's corrupt is, you know, look at these private sector fellows, they're always cheating us, because that's the natural conclusion. The insurer simply gives in, and worldwide what you see is insurance-driven markets produce extremely rapid increase in premia and uh, uh, unfettered consumption of healthcare, because now you've taken away a very important bottleneck, which was the wealth constraint that you had in a fee-for-service market. Why is it? In fact, I would argue to you, we are all free riding on the fact that most of our fellow countrymen are paying out of pocket, which is why you don't really need to think about buying insurance because healthcare is very cheap. Why is it very cheap? Because all of us are paying from our pockets, which is why you can't make a CT scan $2,000 because nobody will buy it, right? You took away that lever by adding insurance, right? Because now, at the point of use, CT scan is free. At the point of use, the supplier of the CT scan gets as much money as he needs to charge. So you've created a worse situation than you would have had had you not had insurance. And clearly, the classic market in this is the United States. Right? You see exactly this behavior. 18% uh, GDP uh, proportion is spent on health, of which about 8% comes from the government. Uh, it is the most expensive market uh, for healthcare in the world. And it's, there is no one, you know, in an interview somebody was asked, is there a health, what is the health system in the US? 
Well, really, the health system in the US is the absence of a system. It is what a market purist would like. Now, you may argue that that's what that society desires, because ultimately, you have to build health systems that are culturally consistent with what they do. Uh, but the reality is that uh, uh, you know, they have the resources, they have the money uh, to, to produce, uh, uh, to generate uh, that kind of uh, uh, you know, expense and to afford that kind of expense. So clearly, the presence of insurance does provide the smoothness that is necessary. Instead of having to pay 10 lakh rupees one year and 5 rupees every year, now you pay 10,000 rupees per year and hopefully if it's sufficiently diversified, uh, you will uh, get the benefit. Now even there though, even there though, uh, even with mandatory insurance, and China is now experimenting uh, with this much more, right? It's, uh, uh, you know, uh, local provinces are asked to, s you know, sell insurance to people. There is a fair amount of subsidy from the government, but the people do have to pay. What they have done is they have created 3,000 insurance schemes, literally 3,000 insurance schemes. Then the pooling benefit that you thought you would get out of insurance is also not as active as it should be, because 3,000 schemes doesn't produce the kind of aggregation and doesn't invoke the central limit theorem in the same way that largish pools might have done. So even there, if you don't design even that badly designed scheme well, uh, you will get you know, uh, significant additional problems in this. The reality is healthcare is not quite so simple. It's not quite so simple uh, that you can come up with a quick fix and say it should be done this way and there is a quick answer here. Uh, ultimately, markets come in. Uh, in fact, what, what is turning out is that US now is standing alone as the country. And unfortunately, the other country uh, that is standing along with the US is India, uh, uh, in which uh, you see virtually uh, an absence of design and free market forces. They have free markets with insurance. We have free markets without insurance. Uh, but uh, perhaps we are, in a way, having a better outcome than they are. At least our health system is a low-cost health system. This is a high-cost health system. But, uh, uh, you know, with, but absence of insurance certainly creates a, a number of uh, uh, other problems that our citizens are facing. Most countries are spending a lot of time thinking about health systems in a much more comprehensive manner. And, and I would argue to you that whatever we have done in terms of thinking, my limited understanding tells me has not been enough. Uh, we have gotten wedded to certain idea, ideas and ideologies uh, that uh, uh, even the Soviet Union has now abandoned. Uh, uh, and, and, and perhaps that you know, is one of the many reasons why we are not able to actually make uh, progress. If I, you know, countries that have looked at it to give you some of the names, and you will be shocked at the names, Philippines, Ghana, uh, Thailand clearly is a leader now in terms of health systems outcome, Nigeria, Kazakhstan, these are not exactly countries with stable environments, stable governments, uh, and have had different uh, political uh, starting points. They have made impressive progress uh, uh, in, in, in offering their citizens comprehensive health care. And you know, we unfortunately have taken a piecemeal approach, and instead of trying to get to the root of the issue, we see a problem, we've layered another solution on top of it to try and see if we can somehow fix the situation. The goal I was given was, well, that is the reality of India. Where should India go from here? What are the issues, what are the poss possible directions that we could follow? Uh, 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 and, and you know, what are some of the ideas on the table? Now, this is something you know already, but just to give you a little bit of a recap about what are some of the design considerations for us? What are we dealing with? What are the issues that uh, we have to address as we think about health systems? And, and Madam raised some of them. But let me just summarize it so that uh, you, you have a sense of where are the challenges. We are now technically a middle-income country. We are not a low-income country. Our per capita uh, GDP on a PPP basis is $5,500. Uh, and, and that's low, but certainly not as low as it was some years ago, and certainly there are significantly poorer countries than ours uh, that are uh, uh, dealing with the same set of issues. One issue, though, that we should not forget is we have a very high degree of inequality. Right? To give you some statistics, and I'm told that these are a little bit dated, but it gives you the flavor of what I'm trying to say, that about 30% of our population has an income 
of less than a dollar twenty-five a day, and that number is getting revised a little bit. But that's the number that we broadly define as the Indian poverty line. But if you take two dollars a day, the number goes up to seventy percent. If you take five dollars a day, the number goes up to ninety-five percent. The U.S. poverty line is ten dollars a day. At ten dollars a day, ninety-nine percent of our population is below the poverty line. So it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a population which is very vulnerable right up to the 99th percentile. Right? It's a very small uh, uh, group that actually, by global standards, and remember, healthcare is a global good. Uh, 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 you know, if you have a serious form of cancer, you will face global crisis when you are trying to deal with that cancer. Right? That is the objective reality of of this of this uh, 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 you know of this industry. Another unfortunate fact about us is that while we are all very pleased we are growing at 7.5%, right, the reality is China growing at 2% adds more per capita GDP than we do. The US growing, I'm told, at quarter percent adds more uh, to its wealth than we do. It seems very likely, and you know, the economists in this room might not agree with this, but whatever little I can understand. That because of our sheer size, it is true that we will be one of the leading economies. But on a per capita basis, even in 2050, we'll be amongst the poorest nations in the world. We will not suddenly become uh, the United States or uh, Singapore or South Korea. That's not uh, where our trajectory is headed. For that to happen, we should be showing growth rates of 20% plus consistently for 15, 20 years. Then we can start to hope for that. But there's no sign at all of that happening. And for a while, as you know, because of a strong investment push, which is pr producing all the NPAs that you see today, we showed briefly 9% and 10%, and we found that the economy overheated. It just could not absorb that kind of growth. So it seems that 7, 7.5%, at least for some years, is our destiny. At that rate, we are not going to suddenly become a rich nation. So any solution we think of would have to take into account this reality. But that is not to say we have not made any progress. For example, infectious disease control, uh, we have done remarkably well. You know, in uh, one of the countries that I studied in my course is South Sudan. South Sudan has maternal mortality rate of 2,200 per lakh. And 2,200 per lakh is the average of South Sudan. There are regions in South Sudan right, that are showing 7,000 as the maternal mortality rate. Compared to that, our weakest state, Bihar, is at 200. Right? Infant mortality rate, we started with numbers of 500, 400. Right? Uh, today, Bihar is showing 41. Right? These are impressive gains, very, very impressive gains. Uh, and, and clearly, something we must have done right. How is it possible that these dramatic improvements uh, uh, have happened? Polio has been eradicated. Malaria is broadly under control, and HIV AIDS, one, something that we were told a decade ago, would be the scourge of India, remains at 0.02%. Now, India is a large country, 0.02% multiplied by a population is a pretty big number. So I'm not going to tell you, let's forget about HIV AIDS. It is a big issue, and maybe our epidemic is in the future uh, in this area. So we cannot certainly forget about it. All I'm saying is, this is something that is good, something to be happy about. Unfortunately. While tuberculosis incidence is declining, it remains high. And people tell me that if you truly measured the amount of tuberculosis in the system, the number is significantly higher than what even the most aggressive statistics try to reveal. And fortunately, while the Indian health system's ability to combat diseases like Ebola have not really been tested, we've had a little challenge about this. There is a concern that we may not respond well if faced with that kind of a lethal disease, uh, uh, which has extremely high mortality uh, and, and will breed in the kind of dense pockets in which uh, we actually live. Uh, and I hope it does not happen, but certainly something we have to worry about. Basic vaccination rates, not comprehensive, basic vaccination rates have gone up in the last 20, 25 years from about 40 to 50 percent to as high as 90 percent for some of the vaccines. Right? But full coverage, I'm told the number is still around 60-65%. The mortality rates of 45, this is the average, and 150 maternal mortality rate are good, but still a wide variety. You know, you will see districts, including 
uh, in our more advanced states, Melghat, Maharashtra, uh, in Gujarat, some districts uh, that have numbers significantly poor, even relative uh, to, to, to Bihar. And, and there is a concern, and which is again worrying, is that the rates of decline have flattened now. The solutions that worked when we were dealing with an IMR of 200 no longer are the right solutions that we are dealing with an IMR of 40. Right? And I was sh sharing with some people, I'm a member of the Health Commission in Himachal. Himachal is now following what I would broadly call the Delhi model of uh, uh, healthcare uh, and, and is finding now that it's not able to make any further gains. Uh, on IMR, MMR, its IMR, MMR remain comparable to Bihar, even though it's spending five times more money. And the terrain is rough, but clearly not the most significant issue. And as we discover in our commission's work, there's a deeper design challenge. On the non-communicable diseases front, we are facing epidemic proportions of, of disease. Uh, uh, there is, for example, one of the things that, you know, I see a number of young people in the room, something that you know, you need to be sensitive to, because yours is the group that is facing this much more, there is a 154% increase in the years of life lost due to uh, what we call, you know, uh, politely self-harm, suicide, right? Uh, states like Pondicherry, Little Place, Tamil Nadu are showing unbelievably high rates of suicide mortality rates. We focus on Yavatmal and Maharashtra, they're actually modest relative to what you're seeing as the normal uh, behavior in states, Puducherry, for example, is a number that is showing 42 per lakh uh, in the number. I, you know, it's already looking like a maternal mortality rate, uh, number that is there. Maternal mortality impacts you only when you're having children. Suicide mortality rate is a, uh, a much bigger uh, uh, number. Uh, and, and clearly, I, I spoke to you about cervical cancer. Stage one hypertension, 30% uh, of the population is suffering from stage one hypertension. These are not numbers of a normal population, right, which means a third of you sitting in the room don't know it, but you have elevated uh, blood pressure, right? Uh, and blood sugar uh, uh, is 15 percent, right? So clearly, there are some things good, but we have some significant issues that we need to find uh, solutions to. Our total health expenditure, I would say, is reasonable at 4 percent to GDP. The aspirational number is maybe 6 to 7 percent. That's where the global average seems to be settling down to. But at 4%, one could say that's fine. The reality, though, is only one third of this number, actually less than one third, 30%, comes from the government through its budget. It is true. Even in the US, the number is 50%. It's not that the US is at 80% government expenditure. But 30% clearly uh, is a number that our government uh, produces. And with these resources, uh, uh, most state governments run their own uh, siloed, uh, uh, primary, secondary, tertiary uh, uh, systems, which by and large have acquired a very low reputation. Uh, I would not even go so far as Jishnu Das's the latest article, which I think perhaps, you know, looks at some narrow perspectives. But even at what we do, we don't do cardiac care. So if you sense SPs, standard patients, for cardiac care into our government clinics, they will not do well. That's because government clinics have never claimed to do cardiac care. But you know, for maternal mortality, for infant mortality, clearly they have delivered this number. But I would say rightly or wrongly, the government systems have acquired an overall low uh, reputation, high absenteeism, uh, and overall low quality. Of the balance 69%, which is the worrying part, there's virtually no form of prepayment. Less than 5% comes from insurance. Look at Brazil, for example. Their government expenditure is comparable to ours. <laughs> But of the balance, more than 80% is covered by some form of either mandatory or voluntary insurance, which is why when I look at payment that happens at point of service from my pocket, right, in Brazil, that number is around 20%. That number for India is 70%. Right? And that clearly uh, is, is the difference uh, between uh, the manner in which the money is being spent. And low levels of prepayment means that when I get a shock, I'm going to get hurt. Low level of prepayment means if I need to go and get my blood pressure checked, my cervical cancer checked, I'm not going to go because remember we spoke about high price elasticity at primary care. I have to pay from my pocket for this service, right? I'm not going to seek it, right? In Thailand, if you go in for a cervical cancer checkup as a woman, you get a gift 
of a little scarf, you get a little gift. As a result, they have 95% cervical cancer coverage, right, relative to ours, which is near zero. And clearly, uh, uh, you know, the whole idea of catastrophic expenditure for many poor people, even average expenditures may be hard to take. But as soon as you have any health event, uh, uh, clearly this is a pathway uh, to bankruptcy. And, and uh, you know, if you combine all of these features, uh, as I said earlier, uh, you will get what we have. High levels of secondary and tertiary care, low levels of primary care. Government itself right, spends more than 60% of its budget on tertiary care. Right? If you visit Ames, and there was some study that was done that I quoted in one of my op-eds, more than 90% of patients at Ames do not need to be there. They are at the wrong location. They do not need the services. I was taken around Jipmer by Dr. Ravi, who was the director at that point. They are, you know, there is primary, secondary, tertiary. Above tertiary, there is what they call quaternary, which is really very advanced care. Jipmer is a quaternary care facility, right? You go there in maternal child health context when you have a 700 gram baby and you need to rescue that baby. When you are experiencing massive brain hemorrhage because some doctor forgot to do the vitamin K, vitamin A, uh, and you know you go to these facilities. These are not facilities you go for uh, routine work. All their beds, all their beds were full of women doing routine vaginal deliveries. There was nobody there that at least you know Dr. Ravi pointed out to me that needed the services that Jipmer actually provided. Right? Uh, and this is not surprising. This is the feature of the market operating. This is the result of the free market operating because they are responding to demand. You know, and, 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 and sometimes, and this is something that we have to be a little bit careful about, we say community accountability, and we think that's superior to insurance. Actually, both are identical. Both are demand-side accountability mechanisms. Indonesia found, for example, in a very nice study, that community-based accountability resulted in complete elimination of preventive care. Because communities wanted curative care. Communities wanted doctors. I visited, for example, one of the NGOs that I was chairing, we have a large program in West Bengal. Right? It, is, it was based on panchayat accountability. The panchayat, when given charge, shut down the sub-center, invested the money in ambulances, and proudly told me that, sir, we've got rid of all this terrible low quality care. Now we send everybody to hospitals. Because now all of the money that we had, we have used to buy ambulances. Right? So an insurance has the same character. Because it both respond to what people think they need, rather than what expert advice uh, suggests uh, that, that they should produce. Right? And you might say, well, you know, maybe the government is not so good. Maybe the private sector is much better. The reality, though, is first of all, it's modest. In primary care, there's virtually no private sector. In secondary tertiary care, there is. But those of you, those of us, all of us, have been exposed to the private sector. The reality is. Most hospitals, I'm saying most because perhaps there are a few that I'm not aware of that are the exception to this, are really real estate plays. If you go and talk to the doctor there, he rents space from the hospital. The hospital does not, in fact, the only thing that the hospital invests in is in billing system because it is worried that the doctor will cheat uh, it, the hospital out of its rent because they have a commission and that they have rent. Right? They do not have an HMIS. All of us have gone to hospitals with large folders of x-rays and uh, results right? that tells you that the hospital you're going to has not bothered to invest in any form of health management information system. And the doctors are independent businessmen doing exactly what any independent businessman would do, maximizing revenue. And you know, I'm not going to tell you they are unethical or ethical. That's simply the way uh, businessmen uh, actually operate. So it's not obvious to me that that necessarily represents either a good or a bad choice. Because Ames is suffering from the same issue. Jipmer is suffering from the same issue. Private hospitals are suffering from the same issue. They're responding to consumer demand and building health systems that you see. All of this is an indication. You know, what people, what my teachers tell me is, if you want to see a bad health system, don't talk to anybody. Land at the airport, walk around the, 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 the city. Large hospital billboards, you know, walking through crowded facilities in any, any hospital, you know it's a bad health system. Right? You don't have to ask anybody. And clearly, India meets all of those issues. And then, of course, another problem is that medical malpractice uh, has been hard to establish. There are celebrated cases of a senior IS officer that 24 years fought the courts because he lost his wife 
uh, in a malpractice case. And 24 years later, the court awarded him. It was an open and shut case. It, most of us don't have that energy. Most of us don't have that zeal. Right? So clearly, the simple solutions don't exist. A laissez-faire approach in India, which is the Indian way, uh, 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 both in the government and outside the government, uh, uh, don't exist. I'm just coming back from Jahanabad in Bihar. Right? It is true there is a government system there that is performing. But the underlying design is laissez-faire. Right? As a result, in the district hospital, there are 700 deliveries taking place. Right? Only 4% of them need the district hospital. Everything else could have been handled. And actually, in that particular district, thanks to some heavy NGO intervention, primary, secondary, uh, primary and the sub-center levels are both working very well. But it's a laissez-faire system. There's no gatekeeping. There is no anybody shows up wherever they want. Obviously, they want to show up to the hospital. Right? And there are a number of negative consequences that come from this. What I would hope to tell you is that it is clear that India needs to make dramatic changes. It's not possible for us to do an incremental fix. And it's not possible for us to say, leave it to the government. We will do it. All we need is more money. Himachal is spending five times more money. It's got 2% of uh, GDP allocation heading to 3%. It is not giving you the health care that you need. And it's unlikely that it will unless there are some significant design changes. Right? Sometimes people say, be careful what you wish for. You might get it. The government may give you 3%. And you may still not have a health system that you actually need. Because we have to think about the design. It's not obvious to me that simply talking in very broad terms about government should do or private sector is bad is going to get us uh, anywhere. The question is, can we actually do this though? Many people say you're a dirt poor country. You just told us that you're going to remain very poor even 50 years from now. Is it really an aspiration that we should be thinking about? Well, we have a number of strengths. 20% of the world's generic medicines are supplied and manufactured from India. I was on the board of CIPLA for a little while. You know, Dr. Uh, Hamid, who is the, uh, you know, now the uh, non-executive chair of the board, he received a special award from the government of Uganda. And I'm told in the speech, the president said, that, sir, before you came, the number one industry in Uganda was coffin making because we were losing so many young people to HIV AIDS. Who could afford $20,000? You know, that was the price of one year of treatment. He brought it down to $300. Today, that number is somewhere in the neighborhood of $70 to $80. Right? Clearly, Indian companies have done this. It is not an abstract idea that many countries have done this. India is one of them. No, no, no. Indian companies actually led the battle, fought the battles, and, and were able to move forward. And we have the entire formula. 364 drugs, I understand, make up the WHO essential drug list. We make every one of those drugs right here in this country and are able to supply it at a very low price. Right? We have internal capacity to do the most complex of all medical procedures. Liver transplants, we can do it. Uh, beating heart surgeries, we can do it. If you go and visit Amrita Institute in Cochin, if you want to marvel at what technology can do, you will see babies that look like mice. Right? They assure me that these babies will grow up to be healthy adults. Maybe not as healthy as if they were born normal birth weight, but they would grow up as, because we have the technical capability. And we know uh, how to go about doing it. Right? We have lots of technology. If you go and look at health systems run by the US, EPIC, for example, is a health system that supports major hospitals in the US. All the coding and programming is done right here uh, in India. And all the support services come uh, uh, from here. Right? And I will argue to you that the human resource problem that people keep talking about is a mythology. We actually have enough trained manpower that is legally authorized. It's not even as if there's manpower that we need to change the laws for. It is legally authorized to provide health services. Right? And this is something that I discovered in my last four or five years of work, that this is not our problem. This is not our problem. Not only that, not only that. No country has solved this problem by putting MD physicians in remote rural areas. You go to uh, rural, rural Nebraska. I have been. There are no doctors there. You go to Alaska, you can't even find a dentist in Alaska. Why would anybody live there? Even Alaskan doesn't want to live in Alaska. Right? Why are we saying that, oh, Indians are the people that want to leave rural uh, areas? Everybody would like to have a better life and, and would like to move forward. Clearly, there does not seem to be such a big challenge here. You might say, OK, all this is there. Do we have the money? Right? Because you know the number of 3,000, 4,000 rupees per capita 
with the government giving only 30 percent suggests maybe 12, 1500 rupees is what we are spending. Yes, if you took 65 rupees as the exchange rate, that number comes to government expenditure 17 dollars. You might say, well, for 17 dollars, you know, give me a break. Can you really do uh, anything? Right? Well, we have to think a little bit carefully here. Right? There are number. You know, one is the current exchange rate. We know even casually that that's not the right exchange rate. Right? People will talk about the PPP exchange rate, which is roughly 17 rupees to the dollar. Right? So you already got three times more money by doing nothing. Right? 65, you got now suddenly three, four times more money than, than you had earlier. Right? Healthcare is very manpower intensive though. It's an unusual industry in which the share of non-tradables is extremely high. Extremely high. And even the tradables, a lot of them are manufactured in India. Right? So clearly, if I look at tradables and non-tradables, the ability of India to generate the resources needed for healthcare are very, very high. Let me give you a statistic that tells you what is the buying power of one rupee in terms of dollars. There is a concept called DRG, diagnostic related groups, that broadly speaking gives you a sense of how much can you buy, uh, how much will a hospital charge you for a certain category of services. The DRGs for open heart surgery in India is 100,000 rupees. Narayan Hidayale will charge you 100,000 rupees for an open heart surgery. The DRG for open heart surgery in the US is $100,000. For one rupee, you're buying a dollar of the most advanced care in the country. Now suddenly, the 1,200 rupees that we are spending starts to look like $1,200. Right? If you mix it all up, you know, this needs a little bit more careful work. Unfortunately, this has not been done because we are very wedded to the story of India does not have enough money, which is why we think there is something else required to be done. My sense is we are in the neighborhood of purchasing capability of six to seven hundred dollars. That's more than Thailand, a little bit less than Brazil. In terms of government expenditure alone, if I talk about total expenditure, we are half of OECD in terms of what our money can actually buy. Right? It's a unique circumstance. Does Africa have this capability? No. Right? The South Sudanese, my new friends, they tell me, well, sir, in theory that's right, but all of our nurses are imported. Right? We have no local production of nurses. All of our doctors are imported. How much are they paid? So they are paid $500,000, $400,000 by the NGOs that bring them in. We have no local capability at all. Right? Yeah. Then this logic does not work. But that is not uh, our circumstance. Right? These are impressive capabilities. Right? The question suddenly you might ask is, well, it looks, at least from this little fairy tale that I have presented to you, that we have all of these capabilities. Why is it that we have such poor health outcomes? Right? I mentioned to you the most sensitive indicator of a good health system is cervical cancer mortality. Right? Because it's entirely independent of uh, genotype. It's almost entirely independent of phenotype. Right? And tobacco is a big scourge in India. But interestingly, other than for oral tobacco amongst women, where we are the capital of the world, we are actually a low tobacco consuming uh, country relative to the rest of the world. So clearly, uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, that cannot be the reason why our cervical cancer mortality is so high. It's just that we have a very bad uh, health system. Right? What are some of the ideas that we might pursue? And certainly, some of the ideas that I am spending a lot of my thinking, uh, time thinking about. One, we have to figure out how to get more money out of the hands of people spending randomly, this notion that you go to a hospital with a wad of cash and deposit it before you can get admitted is a notion that I have only seen in India. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Right? This notion that you're going to pay for advanced care, the notion that you're going to shop from door to door to see, oh, this guy's eye color is blue, that guy's eye color is green, I will go here versus I will go there, this is all vanishing. Uh, even in the poorest countries in the world. The broad statement there is, you need to find a way, we need to find a way in which you take the government money. It's easiest if the government gave us more money. Right? No question, no question. But the government, previous government, this government, they seem to have a lot of money for other schemes because they keep telling us, I don't have enough tax to GDP ratio, then they launch NREGS. So I say to myself, they didn't have enough tax to GDP ratio, how did they find the money for NREGS? Right? But they did, right? because politically perhaps it was found to be important. Clearly, the signal from both governments has been, this is what you have, this is what you're going to get. But all is not lost. Many countries have this signal. Right? 
they have found a way you know uh, to 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 get this out of pocket expenditure into a pooled not just necessarily government hands that's something to thought to think about in some pooled kitty that can be used to actually buy care right some of it is done through mandate some of it is done through uh, uh, you know clever marketing colombia is the leader in this now they've been able to get they have a very high informal workforce they've still been able to find a way to collect money take money from the non poor into the kitty because they are the ones that are spending today interestingly in india we have a scheme called the employee state insurance scheme that applies only to blue collar workers white collar workers people like us we are not required to contribute anything to anybody that's actually quite unusual the reality is while people say we have a lot of informal labor it is true nine only 9% is formal 91% is informal the 9% accounts for 60% of gdp right so we are really the people that are holding much of the wealth of this country we are the people spending much of that 3% out of pocket right if we could contribute one of my colleagues did this research to come up with a calculation we would add not 3% we would add half a percent of gdp to the kitty at a modest uh, uh, rate right? the key issue is to get you know and again these are separate ideas you know there is a whole concern about dead weight loss if you increase taxation without convincing people that you will give them good health care in return they cut consumption because they continue to believe they need to save in order to pay for their that cuts growth in the economy because you now are producing what is optimally uh, uh, less and supplying uh, and demanding less one than you what you would have the good thing about health care is everybody needs it right and there are clever ways that countries have found that people get to substitute this why does the uk feel comfortable with using taxation as a mechanism because they have convinced their population don't save for health right because i'm going to take care of you right then a high taxation regime seems quite consistent with an aspiration for growth in india if you just increase taxes right and you did not convince people that i have a credible answer for you you will get a cut in growth and 7.5% we are struggling at 4% 3.5% will really be doing very badly right so any government of the day would have to figure out what is the right way to figure out it, it, it its taxation policies and of course we have lived through and i as a banker have lived through the visible lack of curve effects that you see the black money the i am told in the delhi market even today about 50 to 60% of what you pay for a house is outside the net right why is the finance minister talking about a reduction in the tax rate i'm sure it upsets you know a uh, number of people but i think he is saying that i am already reaching beyond the optimal level in terms of my ability to collect at higher rates i'm getting less total volumes of, of taxes many many countries have figured this out we are not the only ones interestingly south korea has a very high informal economy they have figured out a mechanism to try and collect money from these people and put it in and now we have this new opportunity with mobile money and you know electronic money giving us new opportunities to try and come up uh, with this and we have left some ideas uh, with the himachal government as a part of the commission's work as to what to do a critical requirement though is we have to improve the purchasing of healthcare right it's starting to appear i don't have the data to back this but quick calculation starting to tell you that the government is an enormously inefficient spender of money it is looking like one of the reasons you are getting such poor health outcomes i had in my mind the sense that government perhaps spends 10% more than is required the number that seems to be visible now is that the ratio could be 1 is to 10 right you know let me give you back my jahanabad story right jahanabad district hospital has an snc it has seven oxygenators they were installed less than 6 months ago they show up in the government accounts as expenditure all of them are broken every single one of them is broken okay that you might say is an expensive technical equipment pulse oximeter right the 3000 rupee product they had many 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 of them in their stores only two are working the expense base is all there right and you know i can give you many stories about how there has been a massive misallocation even the iphs norms that we have which say there must be seven specialists in a hospital himachal we have 100 hospitals according to that rule there must be 700 specialists they have 40 in total what if they done 40 have been allocated 7777 to five places everybody else has nobody right that's the allocation of resource right as a result 
If you need a C-section, they're not able to give you a C-section. What is the C-section rate that's up optimal? Combining two factors, you know, uh, medical ne necessary and the other British phrase, too posh to push, right? You, there will be some people that will be too posh to push. So you should get 25% as a reasonable number. Right? Turkey is at 50, too high, right? 5% is the Himachali number. What it's telling you now is mothers are not dying because they didn't eat well, sleep well, they didn't get good iron. They're not, children are not dying because they were, uh, they had iron deficiency anemia or they got diarrhea. They experienced distress and you were not able to rescue them because you had no surgeons in those facilities, right? But in all of those facilities, the number of MBBS doctors is two to three times more than required by the IPHS now. Clearly, we need to improve the purchasing of healthcare. This is very important if tomorrow we're going to collect money from the non-poor. We're going to tell them to give us money, right? Because if they're not convinced the delivery is going to come in return, they're not going to give you the money. If they don't give you the money, you're dead in the water, right? So clearly, uh, there is a lot to be done. You might say, my God, this is a political challenge. How are we going to discipline this entire sector? My understanding is, you know, Thailand, for example, with a very fractured polity, fought this battle. Shut down government hospitals when they were not necessary. We, according to me, do not need a single new hospital to come up. Thailand decided to put a 10-year moratorium on all hospital construction. Right? All of the money went into primary care. They didn't fire any doctors. Right? That would be very, very hard to do for any country. And doctors are a respected you know, uh, community, extremely powerful, and rightly so. Right? But they made sure that over time, they changed fundamentally the way their health system uh, actually operates. And again, I mentioned the example of Nigeria earlier. I was talking to uh, the, 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 the health ministry people in Nigeria you know, just last week. They fought the battle because they were able to put out a convincing argument that this is what is needed. Line item budgeting to pay people by budget is the wrong idea. We know private sector fee for service, government line item budgeting, these are exactly the wrong design solutions for uh, healthcare design. The third issue is improve availability of human resources. As I've said to you earlier, that we have actually a lot of availability. We have a massive surplus of dentists in the country, massive surplus of pharmacists in the country. We don't have enough nurses, no doubt. Right? We have a number of doctors with formal qualifications in Ayurveda that we, in our dinky little effort in the south, in six months retrain to provide very high quality primary care. And the Supreme Court has said this is very kosher from a law perspective. There was a big case uh, in 1998 uh, with the government of Punjab against the Medical Council of... Uh, now, the reality though is that you have to be willing to go out and accept it. In the US, it's not as if American Association physicians have signed a letter to the government to say nurse practitioners are okay. These battles are going on. The state to look at that has done human resources the best and it's now ahead of Tamil Nadu despite having a pretty bad health system is Maharashtra. Its maternal mortality rates have shot to be better than Maharashtra now, uh, than Tamil Nadu now. Kerala clearly, and Kerala, you know, we have the sense that this is a government story. 65% of all births in Kerala take place in the private sector. 80, we as a country have 70% out of pocket, Kerala is 85% out of pocket. If you talk to the Kerala secretary, he will tell you smart women in private sector. That is the story of Kerala. The government, you know, he says, I'm very happy to be given credit for health systems. I bask in the glory, but I know inside, I didn't do that much. Uh, to, to change it. And finally, clearly we need to use technology much better. It's a, you know, I come from banking. Cooperative banks in remote rural areas are showing core banking, high quality internet. They are able to offer, you are a account holder of some cooperative bank in remote rural Odisha. You can go to Heathrow Airport and draw money from your account using an ATM card. It's shocking how poorly technology has been deployed in the health system. It's just, I cannot understand it. I go on the ground, Again, my recent Jahanabad experience. The same woman was entered in a market where you don't have enough doctors, not enough nurses. The data of the same woman was entered twice. The nurse told me, sir, it takes her an hour each time to completely record the information to pay Janni Suraksha Yojana numbers. I, I just do not understand it. Turkey, one of the things they have done, they don't have a great health system. Their C-section rates are 50%, right? Uh, but on this count, they have done something quite remarkable. And many countries have led the way with technology. And people are shocked when I tell them we don't have it. They say, well, you guys are the guys building it for us. How come you don't have it? 
there are you know a, a, a number of uh, reform measures that one could talk about. I just wanted to leave these four for you, and they are challenging. I'm not going to say they're not, but many countries have taken this journey. I meet and I read the stories of countries. These are political battles they have fought in far more difficult environments and won them. They made a case. Often, in fact, the challenge is for people like me who aspire to be designers. I think we are not going with good designs. Our discussions with the ministry in uh, Himachal were extremely positive on many of these complex areas. Nobody has presented to them good ideas, is my sense. And clearly, I'm not claiming to have any good ideas yet. But it seems to me that there are directions that one could go. And you know, there is some concern that this 14 Finance Commission-led movement you know, perhaps is going to create a problem for us. But I'm not convinced that it will. Does it make sense for Tamil Nadu, which has 100% institutional delivery aids, to be paying 12,000 rupees Janishura Shrivajana benefits, Bihar multiplied by 10, when they have the highest suicide mortality rates? All of that money should have been used to design a health system. Bihar does not have a high suicide mortality rate. The family is intact. The family continues to provide support to young people. In Tamil Nadu, the family has broken apart. A new health system we needed for Himachal, uh, for Tamil Nadu. It is very different from what Bihar needs. I right? am hoping that with this new approach, each government will sit down, maybe not immediately, maybe take a few years, and figure out what is their need. Tamil Nadu looks good, Kerala looks good when you compare them to Bihar. When you compare them to what they could do, they are shockingly poor. The leader in cardiac disease in the country today is Kerala. 35% is the number for Kerala, higher than anybody else in the country. And they have no plan, no strategy to deal with it. My sense is the ideas are there. These are unformed ideas, initial ideas. But there is a lot more that can be done as we go forward. Thank you very much.